Hi, I'm Pastor Stephanie Lape from Crossing Crown Lutheran Church in Rancho Cucamonga, California, and we are continuing our Bible study of Genesis. Today we will be talking about Genesis chapters 37 through 41. So if you want to pause this video and go and take a look at those chapters and then come and turn this back on, that would be great. Or you can just listen if you know the stories well already. So now we are moving into the story of Joseph. And I preached about this last week, but in the next three weeks, we will be going a little bit more slowly than I was able to in my sermon and covering some more ground. Uh, the book of Genesis only has 50 chapters. So this week we're talking about 37 through 41. And then we'll be talking about, let's see, I have a little here we go. We're going to be talking about 42 through 45 next week, and then the week after that, 46 through 50. So for three weeks, we're going to be talking about uh, the rest of Genesis, and Joseph is in all of this. Uh, his story goes to the very end of this book of the Bible. So it's quite a long and complicated and very influential story. So I think that we're going to have a chance to dig more deeply into this and all that this means and also what this means for our life and some of the connections that we can learn even though we live so many years later and so far away. So in the Old Testament and in the Bible in general, it often talks about communities. Um, the Israelites are the chosen people and religion and spirituality is not just about the individual. It's about the community as a whole. And yet in the Old Testament, you have individuals lifted up. And this is one exception. The life of Joseph as just an individual person is lifted up. Of course, you see him in the context of different communities and how he's functioning in community. So I think it's important when we talk about spirituality, the spiritual life or the religious life, that we do look at both of those things, that, that we are an individual with God, but then we also look at who we are in community and what does it mean to talk about society and family and government and all kinds of different um, forms and, and aspects of community. So in the beginning of this story, uh, Joseph is 17 years old. Now we know that Joseph is the son of Rachel, who is supposedly Jacob's favorite wife. Uh, this is the one that, that Jacob wanted to marry in the first place, but Jacob was sort of tricked into uh, marrying Leah, uh, Rachel's sister. And so um, he has lots of children at this point. He has 12 children, one female that we talked about last week, Dinah, and then 11 males. And Joseph was one of two children by Rachel. Benjamin was born a lot later, and Rachel didn't live much after that. Uh, but and, and you'll see Benjamin a lot toward the end of, of this story. But um, Joseph was the favorite, probably because of his connection to Rachel. So uh, Joseph is 17, and he is a shepherd along with his brothers. And he's a, a helper to the sons of Billa and Zilpah, his father's wives. Now, these women were the servants or the handmaidens of Rachel and Leah. So essentially at this point, Jacob has four wives and, uh, and they all have children. But Joseph is this child that is the son of his old age and he just adores him. So Jacob makes his son a coat, a special coat. And you might know of this in the musical Andrew Lloyd Webber's version, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Um, that was my first introduction to this story when I was a kid. And so here you have this, this beautiful coat. Now, of course, it's, it's, it's sort of obvious as you see this unfold that the other kids are going to be jealous. The other children of Jacob are going to say, well, why is Jacob, or the other uh, children of Jacob are saying, why is Joseph getting favored? Uh, it's not fair that he gets this coat. And so in, in many ways, this leads to a destructive relationship between Joseph and his brothers. And so Joseph has these dreams. Now in the uh, in this whole story of Joseph, you have three different dream narratives. You have a narrative in 37, chapter 37, another dream narrative in chapter 40, another dream narrative in chapter 41. In each of these dream narratives that are given, whether it's Joseph's dreams or somebody else has dreams, um, in the second case, it's people in prison with him. In the third case, it's Pharaoh. In all of these cases, each of them have two dreams. 
So that's interesting that it's so well balanced that way in terms of storytelling. So here you get Joseph and his two dreams. And in these dreams, he's seeing everything symbolically, which is, of course, how dreams come to us. Dreams come to us from the unconscious and everything takes these symbolic forms. And so sometimes to interpret dreams, you have to think, well, what might this symbol mean? What might this symbol represent? Dreams are sort of a poetic way of understanding what's going on in the mind. Uh, of course, this was long before the um, modern day understanding of psychology was invented or known. And we know a lot of our dream interpretation today through great psychologists like Carl Jung. Uh, and that was well into the 1900s when that was uh, understood. So here we have, or maybe 1800s. Now I'm wondering when Jung lived. I think it was the early 1900s. Anyway, that's beside the point. So this is thousands of years ago. And, uh, and yet Joseph has these, these early dreams. In both of these dreams, he sees things symbolically, the sun and moon and stars and corn and all these kinds of parts of nature. And he's understanding himself to be one part of nature and all of his family to be other parts of nature. And all of the things that are represented, representing his family bow down to him. So he's pleased with this. You know, I mean, he's young and he's kind of egotistical and he's sort of lording it over his brothers. He also sees his father bowing down to him, all of his family members. And so that part actually doesn't happen. Jacob never does bow down to his son, Joseph, but his brothers do. And so he's seeing something into the future. He's seeing what really will happen much later when he's in Egypt and his brothers don't recognize him and his brothers need his help and his brothers do bow down to him. He's perceiving something prophetically. But it's interesting because the fact that he had this dream and then told his brothers this dream, may, or these two dreams, made them upset enough to do some events to start a cycle that actually make it happen that he goes to Egypt and then eventually his brothers bow down to him. So it's kind of like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Nobody knows. It could be that he's seeing the future. It could be that the dream causes the future. So one is the cause, one is the effect in this sort of cycle. You get this pattern in Greek dramas a lot, Greek tragedies, where like in the play Oedipus Rex, he hears that he's going to kill his mother and marry his father. And then he so doesn't like that, or rather, wait, sorry, no, wait, kill his father and marry his mother. And so Oedipus, in order to avoid that, um, takes a circuitous route and thereby goes into the end, which then proves the dream. So it's this cyclical uh, cycle of, of these dreams. So Joseph is arrogant. He's just not thinking as he's telling his brothers, hey, I'm obviously so much better than you and you're going to bow down and you're going to worship me. So the brothers are sick of this. They've just had enough. And so it says in 37 verse 23, uh, they stripped him of his robe. So that's the first sign. Uh, stripping somebody of any clothing is a way to humiliate them. I mean, we know this from concentration camps when people were stripped of their clothing and given prisoners' outfits to wear. That was one of the many levels of humiliation and taking away somebody's sense of identity, somebody's sense of dignity and worth. And so that's uh, one of the situations here going on. But also it's that particular symbol that started off his brother's getting angry at Joseph and jealous of him. So they take that very symbol away, that symbol of his superiority, that symbol of his beloved state. Now, if they had only known their own beloved state, then maybe they wouldn't feel the need to do that. And that's true of us today. If we see somebody that seems to have, you know, advanced status in the eyes of God, special favor, um, wonderful things happening to them and we're jealous and we're envious. If we can pull back and instead of wishing them not well, instead wish them well, but know that we are beloved too and we're given other blessings and we're, we're given lots and lots of abundance and, and, uh, and we're given the things that we need. We might be given different things, but we're given some really great gifts in our own life. Sometimes that can help us then not to proverbially speaking, strip somebody else of their robe. So here they, in verse 24, threw him into a pit, 
pit is used all over the Old Testament as symbolic of a place of despair. You see this in the Psalms a lot with prayers like, Lord, save me from the pit. So here there's a literal pit. I mean, they're throwing him into a well, a cistern, but it also is very metaphorical. It's the place of depth and darkness and, you know, there doesn't seem to be any hope there. There's no water in this well. They throw him in and they sit down to eat, which just seems like the most callous thing. You know, their brother is like beaten up, laying there to die. And they're just like, hey, let's have a sandwich. I mean, it just seems so, so callous. And and I'm trying to always apply biblical stories to myself, my own life, to get something out of it for today, rather than just keeping it as a history lesson thousands of years ago. And, and I thought, okay, that's kind of like me. I mean, rather than me judging the brothers as being callous, I often sit down to eat and don't think, okay, who are my sisters and brothers in the eyes of God uh, who don't have any food right now, who are proverbially laying at the bottom of a pit? Um, am I just trying to shut my consciousness off from thinking about these people uh, that are suffering as I'm like, hey, I want a sandwich and just sort of thinking about my own needs, my own stomach, my own physical well-being. So we can't think we're very far from these brothers in some ways. So then they say in verse 26, or Judah says to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Rather, they want to sell him and gain profit, sell him into slavery. Again, another level of tragedy here. They're just thinking about profit. They're just thinking about their own well-being. And yet, how many times do I do that? How many times do I think in a kind of consumeristic way, how can I profit from this? rather than treating people like the children of God that they are. So there are lessons here for us to look in the mirror and say, am I ever like that? Then in 28, verse 28, they sold him to the Ishmaelites, who are descendants of Ishmael and Hagar, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago. They sold him for 20 pieces of silver. That reminded me of how Judas in the New Testament sold out where Jesus was for 30 pieces of silver. That's a different number than the 20 here, but still it seems sort of similar. You're selling the, the integrity, the dignity, the life of a human being for some money. Um, it's tragic. It's tragic from Judas to Jesus. It's tragic on this level with Joseph and his brothers as well. Um, in verse 34, Jacob tore his garments. Oh, let me back up. They took his uh, coat. They killed a goat. They dipped the coat in the goat's blood and they told the dad, apparently some wild animal devoured him. Or I'm not sure if they told him that. I think, yeah, J Jacob said it himself. He said a wild animal has devoured him. So he's putting two and two together and, and imagining, and this is what the brothers wanted him to think, that a, an animal killed Joseph so that, so that now the brothers can get out of blame. So um, they're just being really cruel you know, they don't care if he lives or dies. They just wanted him out of their lives. They wanted to profit. Now they're letting their dad think that his son is dead. They're letting their dad believe a lie. Uh, it's just like sin after sin after sin after sin. Um, but do I ever think um, I'm not going to concern myself with the plight of the poor? I'm going to be okay if people die, whether they're in prison or they're homeless or they're immigrants. Am I going to just say, well, you know, I mean, I've got my profit, I've got my food, I've got what I want, and so therefore I'm not going to concern myself with God's other children. It's just a good wake-up call, I think, for me anyway. Okay, Jacob tore his garments, which is a Jewish symbol of great mourning. It's still done today. And then talking about, uh, he, he's saying, I shall go to Sheol in mourning. Sheol is not heaven or hell. It's a place of just nothingness, darkness, where the Jews just imagine sort of just the place of the dead of sleeping. Uh, as Western religions developed, they develop more of a sense of the afterlife. So Judaism barely has a sense of it, Christianity much more so. Islam, the third great Western religion, has much more so of, a, of an imagery of the afterlife. So here this place of Sheol is kind of like a, a shadowy place, but not heaven or hell. So the father is deeply mourning. And the Midianites then sold Joseph to the Egyptians. One more level of selling him into slavery. 
Then it stops in verse 30 or chapter 38 and it goes into this side story about Judah, one of the brothers. Uh, a whole different story about Judah. Judah left his brothers, um, married a woman, had a son, um, then another son, and then a third son. Um, there's a situation about these sons dying, and then they were supposed to marry the widowed wife and conceive a child, and it's just not happening. And so finally, this woman, the, the wife of the first son, her name is Tamar, she disguises herself as a temple prostitute, which was probably common in those days, not among Israelites, but among their neighbors, different kinds of religion. She disguises herself as a temple prostitute in order to have a descendant, to get impregnated and have a descendant. Uh, Judah then just sees her, this prostitute, and sleeps with her, and she conceives, and then he's upset that she was a prostitute. Um, then, but, but he, she had taken some objects of his, the signet, cord, staff, these objects, so she can identify it's Judah that came to me as a prostitute, and it's not just totally my fault. He then says that she was righteous. He uses the Hebrew word for righteous in here, saying that she did justice to the law, this law of having to conceive a child in a way that he had not done. She had this resourceful commitment to justice and social responsibility. Um, this stands out as really interesting because she breaks a law here. She lies, she disguises herself as a prostitute, things she shouldn't have done, but in order to have a descendant, which she was supposed to have done. So it's like she breaks one law in order to uphold another. And this is similar to Jesus breaking Sabbath laws in order to help people. It's like he's breaking one law to uphold a kind of higher law. This then might be seen in a modern day example. Uh, if you can imagine um, people during the Holocaust that were Christian hiding Jews in their home. I know a family who did this. And then the authorities would come to the, the home of the Christians and say, you know, do you have any Jews here? And the Christians would lie and say, no. Now, did they break not only a law at the time? Well, of course they did, uh, a, a German law at the time. But also, did they break a commandment? Well, technically, yes. One of the commandments is not to lie. But they did that in order to hold up a higher law, which was to love your neighbor, to protect um, the, the, the weak and the suffering, things like that. So this makes ethics complicated. Because if you're going to be a kind of ethicist, it's called deontological ethicist, that's only going to do the right thing, like let's say in this case, not lie, then you might not be thinking further down the road as to what you're doing and how that affects people. Instead, if you are a situational ethicist or deal with situation ethics, then you're going to say, well, it depends on the situation. Maybe in the situation of this case of Christians hiding Jews, God would understand that I lie. Uh, God would understand that I broke one commandment to uphold another commandment, that I broke one law to uphold a higher law. Um, I happen to think that that's a good way of understanding ethics, uh, that it's not always black and white. It's not always easy to do. And sometimes you have these really complex situations where people have to say, I'm going to not do one thing that I should in order to do another thing that I should. You see this in the story of Les Miserables, where um, in the near the beginning, Jean Valjean uh, steals a loaf of bread in order to feed his sister's child who was dying. Well, he broke a law, not only a law of the lands, but also God's law, one of the commandments, don't steal, and yet he's doing it in order to do something better. So anyway, that's just uh, one of the things that, that's really lifted up here. Okay, chapter 39. Back to Joseph after this little side story of Judah and Tamar. Okay, um, Joseph is taken to Egypt and he is given to Potiphar. Potiphar is an officer of Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh is a loose word that means an Egyptian king. We don't know exactly who this Pharaoh is at the time, who this particular king is. And, oh, I'm sorry, I missed something that's really important that I see here in my notes. Back to the Judah and Tamar thing. Judah and Tamar 
have a son after Judah impregnates Tamar, thinking she's a prostitute. They have a son named Perez. Perez continues the line, the line of promise all the way to David and all the way to Jesus. So if Tamar hadn't done that, uh, who knows what would have happened to the line, you know, that line of promise. So anyway, that's an interesting side note as well. Okay, back to Joseph. So Joseph is now given into the hands of the custody of Potiphar, who is an official, an officer, um, a pharaoh, the captain of the guard, who's also an Egyptian. And he was successful and things seem to be going well. This is Joseph trying to thrive, even though he's in a, you know, betrayed by his brothers and sold off into slavery and taken to a foreign land and, you know, trauma after trauma after trauma. Joseph is still sort of his positive, optimistic self, it seems, trying to survive and make the best of things. And he seems to be doing well. Well, it says in verse three, his master saw that the Lord was with him. So it's not just that it, Joseph is acting on Joseph's power, but Joseph is acting on God's power. That the Lord is with him and causing all that he did to prosper, it says. So that seems like a fairly good time, all things considered, after you're sold into slavery and betrayed by your family. So anyway, he's doing okay. But then there's the story of Potiphar's wife, who was trying to seduce Joseph. Joseph saying, absolutely not. Joseph runs off, his coat falls off. She then grabs the coat as evidence that Joseph was trying to attack her. Um, they believe her and Joseph is immediately thrown into a dungeon. So like insult to injury, you know, if it's not bad enough that he was betrayed and beaten up and sold into slavery and wow, now he's unjustly accused, according to the story, thrown into a dungeon. Um, he's not caught, he's not losing his faith though. And when you read through this, that's a beautiful testament to just holding on, holding on to faith. Then it moves in uh, chapter 40 to these other prisoners who are there with him in this dungeon, in this prison. And by the way, this is a really good story when we think about what life is like in prison. And we know that not everybody, certainly, but that a lot of people in prison don't deserve to be there. People that have been unjustly accused. Now, again, hear me, please. I'm not talking about everybody, but I'm talking about those who shouldn't be there for whatever reason. I mean, imagine if you were literally innocent and somehow you were at the wrong place, wrong time or whatever, for whatever reason, even if it's a small percentage, and I'm not a, an expert on this by any means, but clearly we know that some cases are that some innocent people are in, in prison, um, even on death row. You know, when we, when we look back, what an incredible tragedy that that is. And so this is a, a good story to talk about prison, prison life, um, how you're stripped of dignity when you're in these, uh, these prisons when you've been unjustly accused. And I don't just mean to be talking about America. I mean, all over the world. Um, uh, Cervantes was in prison uh, the, the author of, um, uh, Don Quixote, which was then made into the musical Man of La Mancha, um, Miguel de Cervantes was in prison, uh, by the Spanish Inquisition. And any reason that you're in prison, if you're innocent or you're perceiving yourself as innocent anyway, has got to be just heartbreaking. So here's a situation where he's like that and he's feeling completely bereft of all hope. Um, but again, amazingly, he keeps enough of his wits about him to help two other people there in prison with him help interpret their dreams. So here we have the second instance of dreams and dream interpretation. We have two dreams here in this narrative as well. We have a cup bearer of the king of Egypt or Pharaoh, um, which either is a person who serves Pharaoh his wine or maybe we don't know, a person who tastes the wine first to make sure it's not poisonous. So the cupbearer is there and he says to Joseph, I've had this dream. And Joseph says, well, I can interpret it. And so tell me your dream. Also, a baker is there, the baker of the king, the pharaoh, who says, hey, coincidentally enough, I've also had a dream. And Joseph says, I can interpret your dream too. So he hears these two dreams, one from the cupbearer and one from uh, the baker. So in 40 verse 12, Joseph says to the cupbearer, this is its interpretation. The three branches of the dream 
are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as he used to do when you were his cupbearer. Super good news, right? You're going to be fine. Hang on for three days. You'll be restored back to your former position. All is well. Then the baker says his dream. And in verse 18, Joseph answered the baker. This is its interpretation. The three baskets of the baker's dream are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. Like, you'll lose it. <laughs> now that's a different meaning than lift up your head in dignity. No, literally lift up and out of you your head and hang you on a pole and the birds will eat the flesh from you. <laughs> I kind of feel like Joseph bedside manner here. I mean, you can tell him, I'm so sorry it's not going to work out, but you don't have to go into that kind of detail. Like the birds will eat the flesh from you. <laughs> Too much information, Joseph. Dial it back a little bit. But anyway, these are very different interpretations of these dreams. Now, if I were the cupbearer, I would be like, hey, I'm going to believe your interpretation. But if I was the baker, I would say, whoa, you know what? I don't believe in dream interpretation anyway, because that's just terrifying. Now, the thing is, he said to the cupbearer who had the good news, please remember me. Remember that I'm here when you are free. Just please help me get out too. And the cupbearer is like, yeah, yeah, totally. I'm going to totally remember you, which does not happen. So in, in uh, chapter 41, well, it says in chapter 40, verse 23, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Only the guy that got you an understanding of your dream and then therefore was able to help you, you know, you're going to totally forget this poor guy in jail. Alrighty then. <laughs> so much for loyalty. So in 41, after two years, now Joseph is in this dungeon <laughs> as an innocent person for two years at this point. Um, so this Pharaoh, Pharaoh had a dream. And he didn't understand it. He called his magicians to help him understand it. They couldn't figure it out. So then in verse 9, the chief cupbearer was like, Oh, right. <laughs> There's this guy that maybe can help you. I totally forgot about him for two years. Jeez. I just get so emotional <laughs> when I read this. Ah, can you believe that? I bet Joseph the whole time was like, can anybody get a message to this guy? He said he'd help me out two years later. Anyway, okay. The chief cupbearer finally said to Pharaoh, oh, I remember my faults today. <laughs> and he eventually tells Pharaoh about Joseph. So in verse 14, Pharaoh sends for Joseph. Oh, finally, Joseph can get out. Now it says that Joseph completely cleaned himself up, like shaved and, you know, I mean, imagine two years. He probably looks just like, you know, hair everywhere and beard everywhere. And I can't imagine a dungeon back in the day would be like the most pristine, you know, holiday inn to stay in. So he probably was a mess. So he cleaned himself up just to be in the presentation, be in the uh, presence of the Pharaoh. And Joseph, interestingly, has had a, tran uh, a transition in, in his own soul, a transformation. Because when he's there and willing to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, he doesn't say, yes, I'm so amazing. I'm going to interpret your dreams. He says this in verse 16. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not I. It is not I. That's like the most humble thing he's ever said. It is not I. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. He finally gets it that he is not the greatest thing since sliced bread in an egotistical kind of way. He's a tool that God can use, like God uses all of us to accomplish God's means and purposes. It's a beautiful thing to see that, that, that Joseph, um, maybe because of this incredibly humbling experience, realized, okay, God, just use me. And I'm not going to say that I need to be, you know, the king of the world anymore, that people all need to bow down to. It's not going to be about me anymore. It's going to be about you, God. What an incredible act of surrender and submission. Further, in verse 25, Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh 
what he is about to do. Do you see that? He's putting God center stage. And then in verse 28, it is, as I told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Three times, Joseph says, it's God that's doing this. It's God that's doing this. It's God that's doing this. What a great place to be. What a different person than Joseph at 17 that was like, yeah, you're all going to bow down to me, me and my coat. I'm just so great. <laughs> He's like, hey, let's give the glory to God. So he basically tells Pharaoh that this famine is going to come. They're going to have some years of really good luck and good fortune, and God's going to make all this food grow, but then that's going to be followed by years of scarcity. So Joseph says what we should do is store some food so that when the years of scarcity come upon us, we have enough food in our storage. It's smart. It's like having a savings account. <laughs> it's like having a pantry with a few months of food in it if you had to have it. You know, it's just having a little bit extra so that people don't freak out when times are tough. It's what our grandparents used to do. Remember those days before like, you know, credit cards and living above our means? My grandparents used to save a little bit for a rainy day. They used to have few little canned goods put away. They used to do some of their own canning, in fact, because they lived through the Depression and they knew that not always were times aplenty. Sometimes times were tight. So it's nice to have a little bit away when you need it. And that's essentially what Joseph is telling Pharaoh might be a good idea. So Pharaoh's like, you oh, know, finally somebody can help me figure these dreams out and, and this is going to be, you know, helpful. So Joseph rose to power greatly. Not only was he freed from this dungeon, but he's kind of Pharaoh's right-hand man. So in um, verse, where am I, 45, uh, it says, thus Joseph gained authority over the land of Egypt. That's a lot of land. That's a lot of responsibility. I mean, authority over that whole area... Um, that's far from his days as a slave and in the dungeon. And he was only 30 years old here. 30 years old. It's interesting because when you look at the religions of the world, not just Christianity or Judaism, but when you look at like all of the religions of the world, there are so many stories of people who kind of are worldly before they're age 30. And then around age 30, it's amazing how many times this happens around age 30. 30, something majorly shifts in the religious leaders' lives. I'm talking like the Buddha, Confucius, lots of Muhammad, Jesus. Um, around age 30, you see, a, you see a shift, a spiritual shift in the religions of the world. And I don't really get what that's about. My mother used to say that in the 1960s, everybody thought that people that were 30 were ancient and old and out of touch, you know, because it was all about youth culture then. But could it be that that's the beginning of a little bit of maturity of not just ego climbing, but thinking of the society, of the culture, of something that's a little bit bigger than you? You begin that process when you're maybe at about 30, you know, give or take. Obviously, that's stereotypical and not everybody does that. But I, I wonder what that's about because it's just so prevalent. You see that so much. So he was 30 here when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He says in verse 51 that he named his children. So he has this this woman uh, that, that with her he bore children or she bore children. Um, he named his firstborn Manasseh. For, he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. So again, not only is he referencing God and not just I'm so amazing, but he's saying God's made me forget that and God brought new life to him after the tragedy of what he had gone through with his brothers. And he's letting his past go at this point and moving on to new life represented by this young child, his son. Then he had a second son he named Ephraim. And then he says, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my misfortunes. Again, talking about God realizing his misfortunes. It's not like he has amnesia and forgets what, forgot what happened to him. But he's saying God's made me fruitful even from that. Then at the very end of the chapter, uh, so we're at 41 verse 57. Moreover, all the world. Now, at that time, that was just 
you know, the Mediterranean area. It's not really like all the world, but it's all the world as far as they knew. All the world came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine had been severe throughout the world. So look how God is continuing to use Joseph. And look how, if he had not gone through what he went through, how he wouldn't have been there to do all those things, to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, to save all that food, to help all those people. This doesn't mean, I, I really want to make this clear theologically, this does not mean that God brings on abuse, trauma, and suffering. God is a loving parent. God would not do that. Um, with the situation with Potiphar's wife, it was clear that was, this was not God's will. God does not want innocent people condemned to prison. God does not want people, uh, family members beating each other up or anybody beating each other up, abusing each other, betraying each other. God does not want slavery. I mean, all this stuff is not in the heart and mind of God. So I'm not saying God brings it on. However, what I am saying is God uses things for good. And if we hadn't gone, you and I, I'm talking, I'm not talking about Joseph at this point. If you, if I had not gone through some of the difficulties we personally have gone through in our lives, then we wouldn't be the people we are today with the wisdom we have. You and I have wisdom primarily because of the stuff we went through that we didn't like. If we had only had a smooth road, we wouldn't be half as wise as you and I are. But the wisdom that we have gained, if we don't go down the road of cynicism and despair and hating everybody and hating life, if we don't do that, if we choose life, then God will use the hard things we've been through in order to gain compassion, perspective, intelligence, wisdom, intuition, the ability to serve people, the ability to even care about people that are suffering. That comes when you've suffered. That, that's the only way. When you go, oh, I had a little bit of a taste of that, maybe not the whole thing, but a little bit of a taste of it, and I know what that's like to suffer. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. And so what can I do to help? So when you look back at your life, you have gone, I can guarantee, I don't even know who all is watching this, but I can guarantee you've gone through highs and lows that are higher than you talk about and that are lower than you talk about to most people. Most of us don't talk about what we've gone through. We don't walk into a grocery store with a sign on us telling everybody what we've gone through. However, you've gone through a lot, I can pretty much guarantee, because you're a person, you're a human being, and who hasn't? And God has used and can continue to use what you've been through for greater good, more so than if you hadn't have gone through it. And that's the miracle of God. That's the miracle of new life from a tomb to resurrection. That's what happens. It happened in the life of Joseph, happened in the life of Jesus, happen in the life of you. So rise up with your strength. That's very specific. Your strength is not mine. We're different because we've gone through different things, but your strength comes from your wounds. Your strength comes from your wounds. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for this story of Joseph and his tragedy and triumph. Thank you that it is our story as well. I pray for every person listening to this. Thank you, God, for the new life that you put upon us all. Help us to surrender everything to you and to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.